Good afternoon. Welcome to Reconnecting Brooklyn's History with Kenneth C. Davis on Immigration. My name is Shirley brown Aline, and I'm the Manager of Education for the Center for Brooklyn's History, which is part of the Brooklyn Public Library System of Branches. Land Acknowledgement. Brooklyn Public Library Center for Brooklyn History stands on land that is part of the unceded ancestral homeland of the Lenape Delaware people. As a sign of respect, we recognize and honor the Lenape Delaware nations, their elders past and present in future generations. For our agenda for tonight, first we have our welcome and overview. And then at approximately 4.05, um, Ken, author Kenneth C. Davis will begin to discuss America's untold immigration history. Then we'll have Q&A at approximately 4.40. And then at approximately 4.55, we'll have our wrap up, surveys, and CTLE. CTLE credit. At the end of today's workshop, we'll share a survey link for everyone educators, students, and others to complete and share your feedback on today's event. If you are a teacher and would like CTLE credit, you must fill out this survey to receive the credit. Virtual housekeeping. For this particular workshop, we will be utilizing the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to put your questions in there and we will answer throughout the presentation. Virtual housekeeping, again, accessibility. If for some reason you need closed caption, please feel free to um, press the closed caption button at the bottom of your screen or put a note to us in the chat or email us at cbheducation at bklynlibrary.org and we will assist you. This session is being recorded, so please keep that of note. The chat will not be recorded, but only the visual the video session will be recorded. After this recording will be up by Friday on our website for viewing. Code of conduct. Please actively listen, be sensitive, and show support for everyone that is part of this workshop. Attendees who violate this code of conduct will be removed. On behalf of the Center for Brooklyn History, which is part of the Brooklyn Public Library, we'd like to welcome all of you here to this wonderful workshop. CBH, CB, the, Brook, the Center for Brooklyn's History is a result of a merger between the Brooklyn Historical Society and the Brooklyn Public Library. We've been around for about a little over a year now, and we are continuing the tradition of teaching Brooklyn's diverse history. So thank you so much for being with us today. And I'd like to introduce to everyone, Ken, Kenneth C. Davis. Thank you so much, Shirley. And thank you all the rest of the wonderful librarian and everyone else who has helped put this together. It's a great pleasure for me to come back to the Center for Brooklyn History and the Brooklyn Public Library. I think the last time we got together, uh, we talked about the pandemic. And um, probably when we talked about it, we thought it would be all over by now. Obviously it's not. So um, that's very much on my mind these days as a historian of the pandemic. Um, let's still be very careful out there, folks. We're not out of the woods yet. And I know you don't wanna hear that from me, but um, as somebody who knows the history of pandemics and what they mean, uh, we still want to really be careful. Uh, I would much rather do this in person and be together with all of you, but uh, obviously it's just not possible. So thanks, first of all, to, um, to Brooklyn Library and the Center for uh, Brooklyn History for making this happen. I am a child of the public library. I grew up not in New York City, just outside of New York City in a small town called Mount Vernon, New York. We didn't have any bookstores, but we had a really magnificent public library. One of those uh, Andrew Carnegie jewels that uh, I was there probably at least once a week and 
usually more often. And if I didn't go to the library, the bookmobile came around, this wonderful big old uh, bus filled with books and you walked in one end and walked out the other end and the librarian stamped your book and it was pretty exciting. So the, the, the fact is that I am a reader and perhaps a writer because of the public library. And I'm so grateful uh, to librarians and libraries for the work they do. And on that note, I will just add, we are in the midst of uh, a terrible moment, another kind of pandemic, as many of you are probably aware. It's a pandemic of book censorship, of book challenges, of book suppression, of even book burnings. Uh, this is a long and dangerous history that I've written about a great deal in my life and my profession as a career. Uh, it is a long, dangerous history because when we are talking about suppressing books, we're not just talking about getting rid of some dirty words or something that might someone might think is too sexy. We're getting rid of ideas. And that's the most dangerous thing there is. And people in power who want to suppress books are really interested in suppressing ideas. They're, oppress they're interested in suppressing thinking that challenges what they might think is the right thing. And so it's very important for all of us, I think, to uh, commit to making sure that uh, books are freely and widely available to everyone uh, in schools, in public libraries. And this is a very, very serious commitment to, uh, that I've made and I've written about it recently on my website, don'tknowmuch.com, can read uh, more about uh, the history of book banning there. Uh, in the 1950s, 70 years ago, books were being suppressed as well. Uh, in that time, the books that were being suppressed was anything that hinted at socialism or communism. Uh, in those days, for instance, uh, there was a textbook administrator in uh, Indiana who wanted to keep all the books that mention Robin Hood out of the public library because Robin Hood and his merry men stole from the rich to give to the poor. That's communism or socialism by another name. And we can laugh at that today, but this was part of, of course, Joseph McCarthy's purge of books and libraries at the time. And the American Library Association and librarians here in New York City were in the forefront of battling back against uh, McCarthy's attempts to purge books from the libraries then. So this is a very real piece of history that we should understand and fight back against if we care about the freedom to express ourselves, the freedom to learn, and the freedom to get new ideas. Um, that's why I write about history. I believe that we have to learn from the past, see what happened in the past because it has everything to do with who we are today. And I also think that we can learn from the past. We learn both from what was done well and what was done badly, whether it's dealing with an influenza pandemic or dealing with a surge of book censorship. We have to understand history. Unfortunately, we haven't done such a good job at that in America. Um, for most of our history. And that's why I wrote this book, which is called Don't Know Much About History. Uh, I wrote it about a little more than 30 years ago. It's hard for me to believe it when I say that. Um, I always loved history. I was a kid who loved history because uh, I was lucky. My father's idea of summer vacation was to throw us in the back of the car and we'd go to places like Gettysburg, and Fort Ticonderoga in upstate New York or Valley Forge, these places that are just names in history books to too many people. But to me, they were real places. And so from a very early age, as a small boy, I understood that history is something that happens to real people in real places. And that's how I've tried to write about it and talk about it. It's not just about dates and battles and speeches and laws and amendments and constitutions. Those things are important. But if we want to truly understand history and learn from it and understand how it's shaped our lives, we have to talk about it as the story of real people. And one of the things we'll do today is talk about immigration, obviously, 
and no story in our past is more about people than immigration. Now we can certainly talk about all the laws that have been passed and all the changes that have taken place in the laws and how polit politicians have argued about immigration, but ultimately it is a human story. And that's the way I hope that we'll approach it in the next few minutes. I'm gonna talk for a little bit about American immigration, the history of American immigration. And I won't go on too long. I don't think it's uh, so interesting to sit and listen to some old guy uh, uh, talk for too long, but I'm going to uh, open this up for your questions and I hope this will become a conversation. Um, I always think of these presentations as a conversation, not a lecture. Don't know much about history, by the way, is written in the form of questions and answers. I ask some very, very simple questions. Uh, did Christopher Columbus really discover America? What does the Declaration of Independence declare? And sometimes some offbeat and rather quirky questions like why is there a statue of Benedict Arnold's boot at Saratoga, New York? Because we all have questions. And sometimes we don't know where to look for the answers or we're not really interested in reading a whole textbook to get the answers. So I tried to write a series of questions and answers about American history that would get at those very simple questions and a few more of the quirky, irreverent ones, but answer them in a few short paragraphs or a few short pages, but also to do it in an accessible, approachable style. And again, trying to emphasize the human part of the story. And that's where we come back to the question of immigration. There is no more human a story than the story of the people who have come to America for centuries now as immigrants for different reasons. Um, I was so interested, and in, as I always am, to see the opening uh, screen there of the idea that we are on Lenape land on the people of the Delaware were here. And we have to acknowledge that no matter how long most of us who have come to America have been here, we are still children of immigrants. I did not know until fairly recently that I am an 11th generation American. That's, um, that's a pretty long time. So I'm not, uh, I don't go back quite as far as the Mayflower, but pretty close. And it's interesting because I did not know that all the time I was growing up, even though I was so interested in history, no one had ever really uh, talked about how long my family, the Davis family had been in America. The first uh, Davis in my uh, background had come to East Hampton, New York. I'm sure you've heard of it. Um, unfortunately, none of it filtered down to me uh, and then spent some time in Stonington, Connecticut, also a fairly nice piece of real estate which did not also um, uh, find its way into, into my uh, uh, property holdings. But um, it's, it's so interesting to me that I discovered this late in my life, long after I'd become a historian and didn't know that I had this history. And it is so important, and I wanna emphasize this and we'll come back to it, that we talk to our families about our family history because that's what this is about. This is about understanding who we are, how we got here. And I think, especially in the pandemic, I've really advocated to students and to teachers that you really spend some time talking to your parents, your grandparents, if they're still around, um, and anyone else in the family who can give you the story of who you are, where you come from, how you got here, what your roots are. This is such an important thing to understand it's no surprise to me that genealogy has become such a huge business in this country. It's a fascination, perhaps even obsession uh, for many. Of course, you've probably seen um, on PBS the uh, series with uh, uh, Professor Henry Louis Gates talking about uh, family histories and bloodlines. Now that we have the advantage of DNA, we're able to do this much more scientifically. But it's so fascinating to see that each of us has a real human story that we, we are made of. And that's the story of America as well. And that's the story we'll talk about a little bit here now. 
This is a country, as you've all heard, a country of immigrants. This is a country of people who ha have come here. Uh, obviously, I'm talking about the people who arrived for the most part voluntarily because there was a large group of people who were brought here against their will in change. I'm talking about obviously African slavery and it's a dreadful, uh, tragic uh, part in American history. And that's the subject of my, one of my books, this one, In the Shadow of Liberty, The Hidden History of Slavery, Four Presidents and Five Black Lives. So that's one kind of group that arrived here. But today we're talking about more about the people who arrived here for the most part by choice, not always. Choice and obviously also necessity. For a very, very long time, people have come to uh, America to escape uh, civil unrest, violence, war, uh, famine, all of those things that have, are driving people even today to come to America and look for a way in have been there since the very beginning. Um, for a lot of us, that story was presented to us as this kind of neat, tidy idea of the melting pot that people came to America, perhaps for religious freedom, like the Mayflower pilgrims, uh, and everyone got here and they were able to uh, practice their own lives. They were eventually were able to prosper and, uh, and become part of the uh, great fabric of the uh, American melting pot. Um, that's a very tidy, interesting story, but it's not really the whole story. And so I wanna discuss that a little bit, what I would call the melting pot myth. And part of that myth is that people have always been welcomed to come to America. And I'm here to tell you, first of all, that that's the biggest myth of all. Back in the uh, 1750s, of course, even before there was a United States of America, uh, one of the prominent Americans said few, uh, he was talking about immigrants coming to America and he says, few of their children learn English. The signs in our streets have inscriptions in both languages. Unless the stream of their importation could be turned, they will soon outnumber us so that all the advantages we have will not be able to preserve our language and even our government. That was Benjamin Franklin back in the 1750s in Pennsylvania. And he was talking about these dangerous, rather what he called stupid immigrants coming in, not teaching their children how to speak English, putting up signs in their own language. He was talking about Germans. Now, this is uh, something that they didn't tell me too much about when I was growing up about Ben Franklin and all the wonderful things he did. And he did many wonderful things, but this was pretty much the attitude of colonial Americans, even before there was the United States of America. That idea continued once the country was underway. Uh, in 1787, of course, we got uh, after, after the American Revolution ends and uh, we figure out that the system of government we had at, the mo at that time wasn't working out too well. We went back to Philadelphia with Benjamin Franklin and created the American Constitution, 1787. Uh, one of the first things that that Constitution would do was tell Congress that it had to determine who could come into the country to become a naturalized citizen. So in 1790, one of the very, very first laws regarding immigration was passed and it was fairly restrictive. It was something that uh, wasn't easy to become an American at the time. Uh, first of all, you had to be in the country for 14 years. And of course you had to be white. Uh, and for the most part, you also had to be Christian. Um, there is this other myth that's related to this, the story of the um, America being a Christian nation. Well, in fact, it was not a Christian nation, but it was certainly a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant nation. Uh, that means that Catholics in particular were not especially welcome as immigrants. So the first group of Catholics who were kind of treated scornfully were the French because the French were having a revolution starting around the 1780s. 
late 1780s. And uh, Americans were very afraid that those dangerous French Catholics were going to come over here and bring the, these dangerous ideas to, to the country. That quickly was replaced then by the arrival of the great mass of Irish immigrants, most of them escaping poverty, and then later the great uh, famine in Ireland. So massive numbers of Irish Catholics primarily started to come into America in the early 19th century. And they were met with scorn, derision, hatred, discrimination. These were now the dangerous, dirty, diseased immigrants who were, who were going to create problems for America. And from the very beginning, those Irish Catholics were discriminated against. Some states uh, uh, in, in the early Republic actually had laws about Catholics not being able to vote. Uh, there were certainly rules about uh, the Catholics not being able to hold office in some states. So this is again, the real story of the melting pot. It was always a melting pot where incoming immigrants, each wave of incoming immigrants for the most part was treated as dirty, dangerous and diseased and somebody to be shut away and discriminated against. That's one of the reasons why most cities that developed eventually developed with sorts of, sort of all sorts of ghettos, enclaves of people that were together so that every, uh, every city had its Irish town and later its German town and its Polish town. And eventually there would be a Chinatown and a Japan town and a Korea town as well. This wasn't a melting pot. This was a very deliberate effort uh, to keep these people separate and not to allow them to melt into uh, a, a great, big, wonderful uh, gathering. So this is the reason I'm telling this story. I, I think it's important to realize that for many, many years, we were given this kind of um, bedtime story version of American history where immigrants were welcomed. They came here for their religious freedom and they all came and prospered. They worked hard and, and uh, it was a, a great story happily ever after. It hasn't been that way. And so I think it's important to assess this and really understand that at every step along the way, the government has thrown up barriers to immigration. As I said, in 1790, the first one was created. Uh, in the middle of the 19th century, after the Transcontinental Railroad has been, had been built, uh, with the assistance largely, especially on the Pacific side of uh, Asian immigrants, including Chinese, uh, a law was passed to exclude Asians, uh, specifically the Chinese. Uh, and that lasted for a very long time, the Chinese Exclusion Act. Um, after the turn of the 20th century, the fear was of uh, certain groups of Europeans because Bolshevism was on the rise in Europe. So another set of laws was passed in the 1920s after World War I that restricted the immigration of a lot of Europeans, including uh, Eastern Europeans and Italians. Um, this came up for us, I, I was telling, uh, saying that family history has become much more important for all Americans, but my wife and I have begun uh, seriously looking at her family history. And again, this is a, a reason that you should really be doing this. Uh, my wife grew up in Queens uh, with her grandparents nearby. They were both Italian immigrants. Um, so her father was a first generation Italian American. Uh, their grandparents spoke Italian to each other, but never to anyone else in the family. They wanted the children to learn English. They wanted them to become uh, assimilated as, the, uh, as uh, we describe that word. Um, so they never really talked about their history of how and why they came to America. So now many years after they are no longer with us, um, we have gone, begun to do the, the research and it's fascinating research. We've gone to Ellis Island, first of all, to, um, to look at the records there. And of course they did both come through Ellis Island and we discovered slowly but surely 
that first her grandfather had come uh, as a teenager with probably a few dollars in his pocket at most uh, in the company of an older man. And he was then taken out to Chicago and started to work on the railroads as a teenager. A few years later, he sends back to his hometown uh, for a young woman to come over. And she comes over and within a week of her arrival, they are married in Chicago. And so we never heard the story. Did they know each other back in Italy in this small town uh, in, in Southern Italy, which was one of the great uh, areas for Italians moving to uh, America from the South of Italy, which was desperately poor and struggling economically. Uh, this is where the great migration of Italians came from, especially from Naples and Sicily and the Southern parts of Italy. But we never, she certainly never heard any of these stories and she never got to understand how these people managed to come to America. And it's a great loss. We're trying to stitch it all back together now and it's a fascinating process. But that is again, the reason why I advocate to students, teachers, make this family history project a, a real project that, that you can look into. Uh, understand, for instance, what your, uh, if you have grandparents, for instance, or great grandparents who either survived the influenza of 1918 or their parents survived it and talked about it, uh, it's fascinating to learn about that. That was hidden in our history in recent years. People didn't want to talk about the Spanish influenza of 1918. So most people didn't know about it, but there's, it's filled with stories of, of families struggling to get through and, and uh, children who lost one or two parents. And it's a fascinating and important story. And it's a story that parallels our time. So that's one of the reasons I really press people to think and talk about, and we have so many ways to now record these, uh, these family memories. It's a, it's a really important way to understand who we are, where we come from, how we got here, and how we can continue to bring those and keep those traditions from the past, whether it's the food or the religion or the family stories that were told back in, uh, in the old country that are being lost with each successive generation, or just a general sense of what it took to make it in America. Um, so that was the, the Italian side. And I have to say that, of course, the Italians, like the Irish, were also discriminated against and disregarded and also treated as dangerous, dirty, and diseased, the three Ds, I call them, of, of immigration. Um, one interesting aspect of that, by the way, is that by the time the large influx of Italians are starting to come in, and certainly coming into Brooklyn, and as the Irish and Germans were, uh, the, the Brooklyn is really such a, a kind of, uh, perfect lens to view how immigration was in all of America. Everything that happened in Brooklyn was what was happening in the rest of America, really concentrated in this, what was then a small city of its own, eventually part of New York City. So it's a fascinating thing to see. But when the Irish had arrived, they finally made it. They started to get int integrated into the, into the country. They started to succeed mostly uh, beginning as many immigrants do, doing menial work, then moving up into the civil service, civil service jobs like the police or sanitation. That was the route that many of them took. And by the time that the Irish had become a little bit more established, then the Italians started to come in. And it's interesting to see that there was a clash between the Irish and the incoming Italians. Here in New York, for instance, they they wouldn't allow in some of the Catholic churches, the Irish Catholic churches, they wouldn't allow the Italians to have their services or they would only let them have them in the basement. So every succeeding generation that has come has faced the same kind of discrimination, difficulty, legal or cultural. And it's important part of the story that we tend to overlook 
again, when we simplify this as something that's about um, you know, the generations of immigrants who come and succeed, that is absolutely without question part of the American story that immigrants have come, they have worked, they have made their way for their next generation to go to school, to learn, to move up from this, the menial jobs to the civil service jobs, eventually to the professions. That is the American immigrant dream. And it has been a dream come true, opening businesses, starting businesses, doing extraordinary things in terms of scientific and medical development. All of these uh, achievements, all of what America has succeeded in doing comes about because of the tremendous, tremendous value and contribution that generations of immigrants have brought here. But it's always been a struggle. And going back to the Irish for a minute, I, I think this is an important story that, um, uh, to tell. Uh, and it's one that I've written about in, in several of my books. Uh, in the 1830s here in the United States, as I said, the Irish were the people who were looked down upon. Uh, in Philadelphia, the so-called city of brotherly love, the city where the Declaration of Independence was written, the city where the Constitution was written, we think about it as the cradle of American democracy. But in, uh, in Philadelphia in the 1830s, it's, it was the same situation. Irish laborers had come there, many of them escaping the famine in Ireland, and they were treated miserably, uh, forced into the worst kind of tenement housing, uh, working on jobs, digging canals, digging uh, 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 subway lines, digging the, trail, uh, the train lines. Uh, they were blamed for any disease that bro broke out. There, so there was a cholera epidemic, and it was assumed that the Irish had brought this. That's, of course, it's not true. The same thing happened in 1918 with the flu. It was blamed on immigrants in many cases. That's not where it came from. Um, but the animosity grew so great in Philadelphia in the 1830s. Uh, this was a movement in America called the nativist movement that really wanted to keep all foreigners out, keeping out immigrants, especially Catholic immigrants, because they were afraid if the Catholics came here in too large numbers, they were going to take over the country and install the Pope as the head of America. Um, that was a real belief. Uh, you know, we're, we live in a world of conspiracy theories today. That was a widely shared political belief preached at the time in some of the most prominent uh, 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 pulpits in America. Um, one of the most uh, egregious uh, practitioners of this kind of nativism was actually uh, a man named uh, Lyman Beecher. And in Brooklyn, you know the name Beecher, Henry Ward Beecher. Well, his father was a very, very uh, vicious, vitriolic, anti-Catholic, anti-immigrant nativist. Uh, part of the story we don't always hear when we hear about Henry Ward Beecher and Harriet Beecher Stowe. Um, another uh, nativist, very prominent, ran for mayor of New York City was Samuel F. B. Morse. You might know that name as the person who was so involved in creating Telegraph. Well, he was also a vicious nativist who ran for mayor of New York on the Know Nothing or no Nativist campaign. But in Philadelphia, this really got to a fever pitch when Catholic people said, we don't want you to read the, the Bible that you're reading in public school because it's so anti-Catholic. And the translation they were talking about had a lot of anti-Catholic uh, sentiments written into it. And so they didn't want their children to be in a school where the Bible was being read. So this got turned into, oh, the Catholics want us to take the Bible out of school. You could almost hear these arguments being made today. Um, this eventually led to two days of very, very deadly rioting in Philadelphia, actually called the Bible riots. And I do write about this in my, one of my books. So this is just one more example, one more of many examples of the kind of anti-immigrant sentiment that has coursed through the American 
political life and American culture from the very earliest times. And so we have to acknowledge that. And it's not to tell these stories to make us feel ashamed or to make us think that we, we did something wrong. It's to acknowledge that this is the past that shaped America as it is today. And we have to understand it and perhaps learn from it. And that's the real purpose of history. And history has to be honest, accurate, truthful, and human. And when we tell these very human stories, I think it makes uh, the, the ideas that we're talking about when we talk about immigration all the more real. Uh, I'm just gonna finish up uh, because I do wanna take questions and I don't wanna take too much time uh, away from that possibility. Um, this obviously is a theme that has continued long past the anti Irish sentiment, the anti Italian sentiment, the anti Chinese sentiment that was eventually overruled. Um, there's a wonderful packet of information that's been prepared for teachers and students that talks about some of the legislation that changed uh, the way immigrants were treated in this country, especially in 1965 when. Uh, the, the, um, the very strict quotas were removed and really opened up America in a way that it hadn't been before. These are very important pieces of legislation that we understand uh, should understand. But I always want to come back to the idea that these are very, very human stories. Uh, and that's the point of history as far as I'm concerned. And when we look around New York City, in a large sense, look around America in the even larger sense, but look at Brooklyn today, we see this brilliant, brilliant tapestry of all of these cultures and we celebrate them. We celebrate the food that comes in. There's no city like, uh, like New York and Brooklyn in the world for bringing in all of the flavors of the world and all the sensations. And that's what makes this, uh, this city so extraordinary. Um, but it's, it's come at a high price. And even today, we understand and we know when we look around at what the, the current atmosphere is like, um, there's tremendous uh, resentment towards certain groups that continues to this day. It has resulted in violence. I won't go into all of uh, all the specifics of that, but it's so important for us to understand that this has always been a piece of what America has been, and we should be much better than that. And we can be much better than that. And understanding that history, I think, can help us be better and do better. And so that's why I think it's so important to understand this past and understand how it got us to where we are today. Um, with that, I am going to, I probably talked longer than I should have or wanted to, and I would like to throw it open to any questions. I don't know, if, Shirley, if you are going to take the lead on that. I am, and I have a lot of questions for you. Um, one of the first question is, what does the Constitution say about how the government can restrict immigration? Well, the Constitution leaves uh, these things specifically to, uh, to Congress, and there have been uh, immigration and naturalization acts that Congress has passed really since the beginning of uh, our, our constitutional republic. Uh, so there is no, uh, there's nothing specifically in the constitution that deals with immigration. It's given, it's, it's one of the powers that has been delegated uh, to the Congress. Um, what's interesting to me on, and, and this is something I didn't get to, there's so much to pack into this, uh, this conversation about immigration and, this, and what it's meant in this country. You know, uh, it's now 40 years ago, uh, more than 40 years ago, or, or about 40 years ago, that um, Ronald Reagan uh, was, a, was the president, a very conservative Republican president. But um, the country was really moving under Reagan towards uh, addressing the long and difficult uh, history of immigration legislation. And we were trying to come to some compromises. And we were really this close to uh, some bipartisan compromises, including a compromise written by the late Orrin Hatch, uh, a senator who just recently passed away, very conservative uh, Republican senator from Utah. Um, 
So this was something that then became a Republican fringe in a way talking point. And as time went by, it gathered steam and intensity so that what was once a bipartisan and even Republican led ideal, and certainly uh, both Bushes were interested in, in seeing some uh, uh, legislation to deal with the questions of immigration that had been left unsettled, um, that question became one more of these very, very angry, bitter wedge issues that have so deeply divided the country. And of course, uh, it came to a full head in, in, in 2016 uh, with the election of the former president uh, who, who not only used it as a wedge issue, but used it as a, a sledgehammer issue in, um, in his uh, uh, campaign. And so we've come so far away from the notion that we could somehow resolve this through political compromise um, that it, it's one more of those uh, dreadful issues right now that we're facing, and there are many of them. These are the times that try men's souls um, that that leave me kind of very pessimistic uh, about how we are going to re ultimately resolve this. I'm I'm sorry to say, um, but yes, the the Constitution certainly gave the idea that uh, naturalization was something that should be done. And it gave Congress, the, the uh, delegated to Congress, the ability to decide how to do that exactly. And you know, for 230 odd years now, we've been fighting about it. Yeah, the next one, I'm actually going, I actually have two, two people have asked me a very similar question. So I'm gonna kind of combine them, which is when did the US first restrict a group of immigrants and when did they begin deporting the quote unquote undesirable immigrants? Well, the, the, the restrictions began fairly early on. Uh, as I mentioned, there was an, uh, an, a naturalization act, I think in 1790, uh, I might have the dates off. And that was uh, quickly followed because there was a war and this is often a, a, a function of war. Uh, there was a, uh, an alien and sedition act that came out of the out of the war and it gave the president specifically the power to limit the uh, uh, immigration and naturalization of certain groups at that time because uh, the French were uh, in the midst of their revolution uh, it was really aimed pr primarily at French people uh, and so that was, I, I guess you could say that that's certainly the first exclusion act, um, but it was followed by many others. And, and in the very beginning, it was quite clear, as I think I mentioned at, uh, when I started speaking about this, the uh, first acts specifically mentioned uh, immigration for white people. Um, this was not let, you know, let anybody in. This was not uh, your, your huddle masses yearning to be breathed free. It was essentially uh, white and Europeans uh, who were being uh, allowed to come into the country. Once the uh, 19th century was underway, and again, the, the railroad was a big driver of this because of the need for massive amounts of cheap labor, uh, uh, Asians, especially Chinese laborers were brought in as soon as the railroads were built, then a very specific act of Congress excluded Chinese from uh, the the um, from the country that it, and it's ex actually called the Chinese Exclusion Act I can probably pull up the uh, exact uh, date of that I don't have it at the top of my head but uh, the Chinese Exclusion Act was in 1882. It barred Chinese immigrants from entering the United States. Um, so the answer to the question is that it's always been part of the uh, immigration policy and the legislation that Congress has passed. Uh, the next big act uh, after that was the one also I mentioned in 1924, which really started to limit, uh, uh, again, 
Eastern Europeans, uh, Italians, because these people were viewed as both uh, dangerous politically and dangerous uh, health-wise. Uh, again, we have to remember this was right after the flu pandemic and the whole idea of foreigners coming into the country and bringing diseases with them was always part of the mentality behind some of the Immigration Exclusion Acts. Um, and this continued for the most part until 1965 uh, and a very, very important piece of legislation was passed that removed most of the very strict quotas on, on people come from different countries. Um, if uh, I, I believe that all of that information, by the way, is in the packet that was prepared um, for the uh, students and teachers. Actually, it is with the, um, for all of you who are participating in the educator packlet, packet along with the student packets. We do have information about some of the exclusion acts. We have primary sources, oral histories, and other things for you to use, as well as um, Ironically, Ken, the next question I was going to ask, which you sort of alluded to, is how was the anti-Chinese sentiment overruled? How was it overruled? That's a really good question. And um, it's a very slow process because the Exclusion Act lasted until the 1940s, I believe. Um, so it's really only uh, the... Um, uh, yeah, 1952, actually, that the uh, McCarran Act ends the exclusion of A Asian immigrants to the United States. During World War II, because there was a labor shortage, um, you know, labor always factors into immigration policy. Um, does the country need more workers? Does it need more cheap labor? Uh, there was a, uh, a period uh, where Mexican immigrants were allowed to enter the country uh, primarily as agricultural workers, of course, because of the need for um, making sure that the crops were being grown and delivered because the troops needed them and the country needed to feed not only itself, but it needed to feed its troops uh, uh, around the world as well as feeding uh, other nations. Um, that uh, act was eventually reversed and a, a lot of those Mexicans were uh, at one point rounded up and, and really put on railroad trains and uh, railroad cars and taken out of the country. Uh, another particularly insidious moment in immigration history. And um, actually this is sort of a two part question. One is, can you talk about the role of schools as a vehicle for assimilation or indoctrination? But then I also have another question I'm going to ask you. Um, which is about the fact that you have encouraged um, families, search, um, searching family history, okay? But what about the kids who are adopted, children who are African-American who might not be able to find their roots, um, kids who have parents who are not genetically related? Um, suggest, um, the, um, the suggestion is teachers sure. not take this project on without considering non-stereotypical families? I think that's an excellent point. I'm glad somebody raised it, so thank you. Obviously, you know, this, is, uh, this, isn't, this becomes more complicated in, in some uh, questions. In fact, I think it's the ethicist in the New York Times was just asked about this related to um, uh, children finding out who their biological parents are. So obviously, adoption and the changes in society that have allowed uh, for um, donors and surrogates certainly changed the, uh, the landscape to a, a large degree. And I didn't mean to be insensitive about that. I'm sorry if, if it came across that way, but uh, certainly a, a teacher, I think, uh, understands that uh, there are complicated stories out there and not everybody is, you know, leave it to Beaver's family. A, a cultural touchstone for me, showing my age, you know, is, uh, or the Brady Bunch, I guess, is a, uh, maybe a more recent, better example, you know, or Full House, any, any of these, you know, perfect American families. Um, so there, there are very, there are fewer and fewer of those perfect American families. I think it's, an, uh, it's still an interesting question because uh, 
you can still treat it sensitively and you can still talk about, I mean, as a, I suppose, as an adoptive uh, parent might still want to instill in their child uh, who they are and who their grandparents are. So I, I think that, that, that the general idea still applies and it would definitely require a degree of sensitivity and most my experience, most teachers have such sensitivity. Um, I think this is still teacher appreciation week. And so I appreciate you for what you do and who you are and your very, very difficult job, especially in the last couple of years. Um, to the first question, it's a very interesting one, the question of schools and assimilation. Um, I had the experience a few years of, ago of going to the Tenement Museum in the Lower East Side. Uh, I would highly recommend it to anyone who's interested in exploring these questions of immigration because that's what they really do there in the, uh, at the Tenement Museum. And you can you know, access their site and learn a lot about it uh, without actually visiting, but it's, it's really worth a visit. Um, they talked about in one of the walking tours that I did with them, there's a school and I believe it's on Grand Street, a school which was the one of the early schools built in what was the heart of what was then America, uh, New York's immigrant community. And they actually say at the Tenement Museum that the idea of the melting pot really came out of that school. And, you know, it's a, it's a word that we use all the time and it's an interesting metaphor, but what does it really mean? And back then, it really meant that they were wanted all of these children from a variety of cultures, a variety of languages and lands to assimilate and become America. They wanted to put them into the melting pot literally and melt them into one thing. Um, Henry Ford actually also got this idea. Henry Ford, the, the car maker who had some horrific ideas uh, about um, related to anti-Semitism, for instance, and also eugenics, um, he really was a big believer in this. And he actually created and had built uh, a melting pot where he wanted all the foreign workers to go into this place and they would come out as Americans. So there's a, a piece of the melting pot idea, which is, yes, assimilation, but how much of it is forced assimilation and how much of it is giving up your cultural identity of your of, of your home, of your parents. So for instance, the Tenement Museum explains at this public school in the Lower East Side that mothers were discouraged from giving their children certain foods to bring to school because they didn't want the heavily, what we think of as the wonderful idea of ethnic food. They didn't want children to bring so-called ethnic food to school. They wanted them to eat a, 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 a kind of wholesome American meal. Um, so the Italian mothers didn't, wouldn't be sending you know, anything with garlic in it. I mean, I'm, I'm oversimplifying here, but think about that as the downside of what this idea of the melting pot is, that these schools at that time, and I'm talking about the turn of the century, early 20th century, uh, did really want to erase those cultural identifiers that we think of as being so important and so intrinsic to who we are and so intrinsic to what a family is. So it's a really interesting aspect to this whole question of, of melting pot and assimilation. Um, certainly one want children to come to the country, learn and uh, succeed. And how much of that is assimilation while still retaining your, uh, your cultural and uh, ethnic heritage, your religious heritage is a very, very important and difficult question. And I think, you know, certainly here in New York, I think we do a much better job of celebrating that kind of diversity uh, than might be going on in you know, rural Maine or Kansas. Um, and so that's, that's to be lauded, but um, that was the idea in New York City at the turn of the 20th century.
Okay, Ken, because we have just time for one more question, which is from Misha Jemison, which says, thank you for your time. This has been very informative. I'm wondering if you can share ideas about how teachers can design lessons that promote the dissection of nuance and perspective when it comes to immigration. Okay, I'm going to again refer back to your your packet because I've had a look at I had nothing to do with preparing it, but it's it's filled with um, primary sources, uh, some some really good exercises. So I would say um, look at that first for starters, and you'll. But um, yeah, I I I think that while I'm accepting the notion of one of the questions just now about the danger or the, uh, the, the complications perhaps of having children exploring their, their heritage, I, I still think it's a, it's a valuable idea um, that we, we, we think about history as not just dates and battles and speeches of what happened out there, but history is, as how it happens to us as people. And that's why I, I believe that this idea of family history uh, is important and valuable. Again, giving you know, being sensitive to the fact that not every child is going to have the same uh, sort of family history to go back and look at. And probably with that, I know you're up against the clock. We should say goodbye. And I'll just say a very, very quick thank you once again um, to all of you um, who came and listened. And uh, it's a pleasure to talk to you. I love this subject. It's so important. And I'm so, so grateful to the Brooklyn Public Library. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ken. I just, I do want to leave just, I do want to read just one comment that Michelle Ewing, ha, Ewing wrote, which is, this is riveting. Understanding this history can be therapeutic and a catalyst for racial and ethnic healing. It creates space for white people to talk, to speak about the discrimination their ancestors faced in facilitated DEI conversations. Um, it can invite them to the conversation without creating an environment of oppression Olympics, if done correctly, which I do agree with. I also say that, yes, the lessons in our booklets for both, for both, for both, for both teachers and the students are actually designed so that you can be able to tell history from different perspectives, and then you could be able to be able to understand, maybe you could be able to understand each other better. So on behalf of the Center for Brooklyn's History, Kenneth Davis, thank you so much. I've always been such a big fan of yours, so I am so pleased. Thank you so thank much. Thank you, Shirley. And